Hello, everyone, and welcome to TMA's Empowerment Clinic webinar series. My name is Rachel Bromley, and I am TMA's Senior Manager of Patient Education, Support, and Advocacy. And this is the month of November, and we are honored to honor our veterans this month for Veterans Day. And so we have decided to talk about the VA claims process, which if you are a veteran and you've been involved in this process in any way, I'm sure it's your favorite thing of all time, right? Totally smooth. Absolutely. You don't even need to watch this webinar. Yeah. Okay. So that's why we're here. And I'm honored to introduce to you a few of my favorite people and a new favorite person. I've got Augie D'Augustinus here, Larry Lesher, and Carrie Baker with the law firm Hale and Ponton. And I will let them introduce themselves. Go ahead, Augie. Let's start with you. Well, thank you, Rachel. Um, it's, it's an honor to be asked to uh, participate today. Um, I am a 20-year uh, a Navy veteran and um, who also served on the uh, TMA Board of Directors for seven years, three years as chairman of the board. And um, I have been diagnosed with uh, IBM since uh, 2007. And uh, I just recently, um, on through my second appeal process, uh, was finally granted uh, approval for service connection for my IBM 100% disability, uh, thanks to the efforts of uh, Mr. Kerry Baker, but we'll hear more about that uh, a little bit later. Well, thank you so much. And Larry? Yes, I'm Larry Lesher. I'm a nine-year veteran of the Air Force. I was diagnosed with IBM in 2005. Uh, got really involved in it, started a support group for Northeast Florida in 2007, which is still going, uh, although uh, as light as it might be, uh, we still try to uh, to get together and keep everybody involved. Uh, I also have filed a claim with the Veterans Administration in 2006, and only just recently, actually August uh, of this year, and thanks to Mr. Baker and his firm, we were able to get uh, an immediate uh, reversal of the claim uh, being denied to being totally and permanently disabled in service, uh, service connection, 100%, uh, everything that went along with it, support or priority group one, which gives you just about every benefit that the VA offers. And again, like I say, thanks to Mr. Baker and his efforts and his firm, we were able to get it done. I only ever filed for IBM. I have never filed for anything else. So I was putting everything on Mr. Baker. <laughs> I had nine <laughs> days left. <laughs> I had nine days left well, to before either I make even, it or break it. Before I even let him introduce himself, I'm just going to go ahead and, and with the disclaimer uh, Carrie, this is basically a one hour uh, advertisement for your services because <laughs> everybody is so happy with what you have done. So go ahead and tell us a little bit about what you do and what was the magic that turned this all around? Because getting 100% um, disability benefits for IBM has been unheard of practically. And every time when I started the veteran group, I guess two years ago, um, I mean, we had only heard of one person and he was like this unicorn, right? <laughs> so, so go ahead and tell us a little bit about what you do and how you got into it. Well, I always like it when there's no pressure. So, um, you know, my name's Carrie Baker. I'm uh, I'm an 11 year Marine veteran. Uh, I was in from 87 to 98. I was uh, all over the world in Desert Storm and Somalia and Panama. Uh, and uh, I've been doing this business in one form or another pretty much since 1998 when I got out. Uh, I was with a VSO, uh, worked my way up through the ranks there, uh, and eventually became their assistant national legislative director. At that point, I went to VA. Uh, I was, uh, they kind of recruited me in DC. I was their policy chief in VA central office in compensation service. Uh, that was a, a very interesting and educational experience. Uh, so I know where some of the 
the bodies are buried, and, and I'm sure VA doesn't like me running a muck in their pellet world. Um, and uh, but then I eventually left and went to the private sector. Uh, I worked for another firm for some time. Uh, I have my own small firm on the side, uh, but it's 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 very small. Uh, I'm not growing that because it's just uh, one person's. It's a little tough to in this this business uh, without a team, and I have a team um, at Hill and Ponton who I work with now. Uh, they're a great uh, law firm. Uh, Matt Hill is a managing partner. Uh, I work real closely with him, um, but you know, I, so I'm able to bring everything I've learned throughout the you know 25 years now. Uh, I'm doing this at different sectors uh, to bear sort of on these kind of cases and and they're not easy now and I can't take the credit uh you know uh, that that Larry and Augie probably give me uh because they had done a lot of work uh before I got a hold of the case um you know I might have been able to bring it home but uh you know, I it was a lot of stuff they had done. Uh, it is a lot of work. So let's kind of we'll we'll spend more time talking about appeals since that's you know the area that you um, specialize in and help people with. But if we could just basically capture like what's the initial process like? Let's say we've got a brand new person with myositis who is a veteran but never made a claim. You know, what's step one? Step one is is. Pretty straightforward. You file the application for benefits with VA. Uh, and that's really all you need. It's a it's a certain form number. It's a twenty one dash five two six EZ. If you've never, you know, if somebody wants to look that up, you can get it on VA's website. Um, you know, you fill it out online. You can print it and fill it out with uh, pen and ink. Uh, you know, it's got where to mail it or where to fax it or you know, basically how to submit it. Um, well, I saw on Hill and Ponton that you guys have a book, a free ebook on VA claims. Is does this um, would that be a helpful resource for people? It probably would. Uh, I have I can't say I've read the whole ebook, uh, but I <laughs> uh, they they got a lot of stuff on their website. It's a very uh, very nice website. Uh, I, you know, and I um, I could probably even learn some stuff if I started tooling around on their website a little bit. Um, Right. We got a whole department that 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 manages that, but uh, but I would well, say that is on hillandponton.com, H I L L and P O N T O N dot com, and it's just a pop up. You get the free ebook, and you can check it out. And if you have any questions, reach out to them. Um, okay, Carrie. So they've done this process. They've put it in, and they've got denied. Uh, what is their option next? Ooh, well, that, that's where it starts getting tricky. Right? If you've just filed a claim uh, and you've gone through that process, and there is a process depending on what VA does in that, I can explain that if you want. But let's say they've gone through that process and the and the claim is denied. From there, you need to figure out one. You you got to appeal it uh, if you're going to win it, uh, and you've got a, a year to do that. But because of some rules that changed in 2019, you've got a number of different options on how to appeal it. Um, you can go to the Board of Veterans Appeals, or you can go uh, do and do an appeal locally. Uh, and you've got some options either direction, wh whichever one you choose. If you choose locally, which most people choose at first, there's two different routes you can take. You can file what's called a supplemental claim uh, and you, again, you've got a year to do this to keep your effective date from the original claim. A supplemental claim requires new evidence, evidence that was not already in the record. Uh, technically, it requires new and relevant evidence, but the relevance, if it's new and pertains to the claim, the legal bar is low enough that it, it will most likely be relevant. So think of it as new evidence that that was not in the record previously. Um, and the VA will issue another decision. Now, the other option is, it's locally, that is, is to do a higher level review appeal. In that lane, you cannot 
give them new evidence. That is a uh, that is a reconsideration, basically, and it's an appeal on the same record that was before VA previously. You can request an informal conference uh, with uh, with the HLR, is what we call it for short. Um, those work fairly good, depending on the type of the, you know the type of case, uh, the evidence that you have, how strong it is. Uh, these particular claims, though, with IBM. Um, they're a little bit different of an animal. Um, and I'm not saying you could not win um, any of these cases by going to HLR or supplemental claim. But what I wanted to uh, kind of back up a little bit because I got ahead of us mm -hmm. in that um, we haven't even talked yet about, uh, you mentioned working for veteran service organization. We may have people watching this that don't know what role that they might play in that. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit about, uh, and, and or Larry or Augie, either one of you um, could talk about the choice of when to bring in a VSO or when to use an attorney. Augie, you want to take that one? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I would, Rachel, because it is uh, my own personal experience. Um, nothing is not nothing like a bad experience to be a good education, and um, I filed my initial claim back in uh, 2012. And, By yourself? Uh, I used the uh, VS of a state-sponsored uh, veteran service office uh, for assistance to file the, the initial claim. It came back denied. Um, we appealed. Uh, the second denial came in. And here is where I learned my lesson the hard way using a VSO. Um, the VSOs, of course, they, they they don't charge anything for their services. And it can be a state-sponsored VSO or a service organization VSO. But what happened is, is that a second appeal came in, our second denial came in. We I went to the VSO. We some wrote up, finished all the paperwork on a second appeal. And the VSO put it in the fax machine, sent it did not wait for a confirmation and the v and the VA said they never received it. So a, a year later when I had heard nothing, my, my claim dropped dead. So in 2018, I had to start the process all over again. Um, and not having learned my lesson the first time completely, I used the VSO uh, only this time, the original VSO was, was gone and I had a new guy to work with. But uh, again, I went through my, my first appeal, um, my first denial, second denial, and then when we, I filed the second de, uh, second appeal. That's when I got a notice from the uh, the veterans, from the VA, about a uh, appearance for with in front of a law judge. That's when I started getting nervous, and I started looking for legal representation because at this point I did not have the confidence in the VSO to see me all the way through the process um, uh, professional, uh, proficiently. I, I, don't, I just think that the VSOs have, they're covered up with so much work, they can't give, give you the attention that your claim actually needs. So I called Hill and Ponton, and that's how I got teamed up with, with Carrie. And, and what I have learned is that the difference between a VSO and the service that someone like Carrie can provide is that the VSO is good at knowing the forms and filling them out. He asks you questions, fills them out, but he doesn't know the inner working. You see, Carrie has the experience of having worked on the other side um, and, and he knows the inner workings of the VA. And uh, and that just really gives him a, a depth of knowledge and experience that really transcends into uh, more effective uh, help when, when you uh, file an appeal. So... It's, well, that makes me think that people are going to want to start with an attorney right away, but is that even an option with an initial claim? And and this is something that I think Carrie could probably address better than me because an initial claim, they, you know, it, I think the, uh, from a legal standpoint, I don't know what they want. They don't know what to really appeal because I haven't heard anything yet from the VA. A VSO will, will be glad to help anyone with an initial claim, 
but I think Kerry might want to address whether or not it's uh, something that an yes, attorney. Go ahead, Kerry, because I've heard that I've heard veterans being taken advantage of at that initial stage. It, well, and, and you, you, there's not a whole lot of you know what I would call extremely reputable firms out there handling veterans cases. Um, and you've got some just a kind of an overarching there's you know you've got compensation benefits in the VA you've got pension benefits in the VA there are firms out there that do nothing but pension cases and that's not what we do um, those are a little different uh, VA doesn't like them I don't particularly like them um, and you know for just reasons that they do come in right at the beginning of state of state and they charge people up front uh, we're not allowed to do that in compensation claims. Uh, but but here's, I mean, the reality of it is this. Most firms, and us included for the most part, uh, want to see a, a, a rating decision that we can appeal, right, when we take on the case, because that gives us something to appeal. You know, it, it, we can see what VA's decided to some, you know, why they decided it to some degree. Uh, we can get an idea if, this, if that's the case we think we can win. Uh, you know, we only get paid uh, on, on our firm and most, you know, any compensation uh, side of the house type firm uh, when we win a case. Right? We're, we're only allowed to take a case contingent up on us winning the case. Uh, so we're not allowed to charge up front. Um, there are there are. Uh, there are a lot of veterans out there that need help. There's only so many of us that are, that I think are pretty good at what we do. Uh, so we, we do end up saying no to a, a lot of cases. And it's not because they don't have good cases. It's because we just don't have the type of uh, people power, human power to, to handle that volume and that volume adequately like the, like veterans deserve. But having said that, that's not to say we can't take a case right off, right up out of the gate, so to speak. Uh, we can, all right? We, you know, we can exchange the uh, paperwork to get the power of attorney. Uh, we can file the claim. Uh, there's no rule whatsoever saying we can't do that, okay? If that claim's granted right up front with no appeal, if it's never been claimed before, and which means you have to use that one form I told you about earlier, the 526, if benefits are granted on that, all right, we're not allowed to charge a fee, okay? Uh, and that's why a lot of firms, you know, want to see the rating decision that they can appeal first. Uh, and I agree with that because you don't want to have to go hire or depend on a firm for hire when you can win the case yourself the first time out of the gate, right? Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, the realistic, the, 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 the real world sort of, reality here about IBM cases is there's some nuances here that we just feel that VA is not going to get right. Um, mm -hmm. Majority of these cases, if not 100% of them, are probably going to get denied up front. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and that can shift our, uh, uh, that can shift our, uh, you know, decision making on when to take these cases. If we know VA is just going to outright deny these cases, regardless of what we do up front, then we would sometimes rather do the claim ourselves, make sure it's done right, so we can start. You know, if, if we do win up front, great. You know, but if we don't, and I don't, you know, we haven't seen anything like that yet, obviously, uh, then we are right into the appellate process the way we want to be. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and we can we can start that case. We know if we're not going back and fixing anything uh, right. from somebody else. And so there are some advantages to that. Um, but there are also decisions that we have to make that, you know, maybe just because of workload, we can't do that. Uh, right. So we might tell somebody, we'll file the claim. Uh, if it's denied, give us a call. We'll take the case at that point and we'll, we'll run with it. But there's just, there's no rule saying we can't. Uh, the okay. rule is that we can't charge up front. You can't charge for filing an application. Uh, there are percentage limits that we can charge. Um, so if someone out there says, um, uh, you pay me $1,000 and I'll submit your claim, that's legal or illegal? Go the other way, all right? That's not legal, all right? That, you're not supposed to do that. Uh, there are some, I, I don't know of any by name, but I've heard of firms 
Yeah, I've heard these stories and I just want our audience to know that that's straight off a red flag. And that's, you know, that's charging for filing a claim. I have heard of people charging for putting a claim together, <laughs> or whatever that means. Uh, mm -hmm. Having the vet file it, but the this firm will build it sort of for the, you know, I think those are more of the pension cases because you have to, there's more to show as far as income and 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 earnings and assets and that type of stuff. Uh, and then we don't do those types of cases. Uh, but yeah, if somebody says that's what you know they'll do to file your claim, they'll take a certain amount of money. Uh, and, and, no, that's a no-go, go find somebody else. Now the rule as far as the limit on the con contingency fee is a third. So if you've got a firm saying, well, we'll take your case for 40% of the back pay, that too is illegal, right? Uh, okay. We, we cannot charge more than a third. We cap our fee at 30. Uh, we don't charge a third. Uh, you, you know, we can charge less, but we can't charge more. Uh, okay. And I wanted to talk to Larry a little bit and hear your story. You mentioned this journey started in 2006. Uh, you're muted. Go ahead and unmute and, and let us know about how, you know, your partnership with the VA went. I initially was on. I initially filed my claim myself in 2006, and like 90% of the veterans, you immediately get a denial, and you say, you know, I, oh, this is crazy, you know, I let it go, and I went beyond the year, and as as my disease progressed, and the worst I became, unable to to maneuver around, I felt it was time to go back after it. <clears throat> so I went back and reapplied. And unfortunately, uh, that one was denied as well. And I missed it by a few days and had to redo again. Well, I was going to get a VSO and uh, he, he felt he knew he could do the job, but I told him I was down to just a few days and I was not able, you know, to get, I wanted a hearing from a law judge. And uh, so he put me in for an extension or uh, whatever amount of time I had. And then I talked to Augie because he said that he had had favorable results with uh, Mr. Baker. So mm -hmm. I called Mr. Baker and, uh, told him that I already had my docket numbers and had a hearing date. And he's like, uh, really? You know, and how many days do we have? Like nine days. <laughs> it was like, uh, I was waiting for the hammer to drop and him say, go find somebody else. But he did in fact take the case. And, and, and uh, normally we would, because we would not be able to prepare that quickly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, but he I had, a, he had, all of the information from Augie, uh, he knew what he was getting into. Uh, like I said, I only ever filed for IBM. I've never filed for anything else. So my thoughts were that it would be a bit easier to go in for a one claim and they don't have to worry about how many other claims are in there or what's what the rules are. And uh, Carrie just went over the whole thing with me uh, and we had, in, in a matter of days, we had the hearing with a law judge. Uh, obviously, I was I was scared. You know, I'm, I'm an old man, but I was still scared because I knew that if this if this didn't make it, I was done. You know, I'm I'm a month shy of 80 years old. Where am I going to go now? You know, this was like I had to do something, and uh, Mr. Baker. When in, so people who don't understand the process, when you say you had nine days left, is that because you it was coming up to the end of the year since you put correct. in that claim? So it expires after a year, correct? Yes, that's correct. And then, um, Augie, could you talk about people getting it done on the first try? That is rare. Like you said, there was one uh, many years ago that, uh, you know, his his decision letter was circulated around and, and uh, but nobody's ever actually seen the guy. Um, but 
So we, you know, he could be a myth, just a ruse on behalf <laughs> from the VA. But um, but earlier this year, <clears throat> there was not one but two uh, veterans who filed claims, initial claims for IBM. They both had IBM, and they were both awarded uh, service connection for their IBM on their initial claim. No denial, no appeals. And, were uh, they like Larry's claim where it was just IBM only, or did they have a hodgepodge that, of things? That I, I do not know. I don't know the details. I just right. know from, from good authority that, that both were uh, approved. Um, and I, I, quite honestly, it'd be real interesting to get the details and and see what they uh, they submitted to get that award. Um, what is the rule or the uh, process for how many appeals you're allowed before you can't appeal anymore? Well, what I was saying earlier is you got your local appeal, and and you can you can almost go back and forth between supplemental claim and HLR higher level review locally for a long time. Um, you can't do a higher higher level review after higher level review. Uh, you can do as many supplemental claims as you want, as long as you have new evidence for each one. But that's not wise. You're just going to you're just spinning your wheels. Eventually, you're going to need to go to the Board of Veterans Appeals, and sometimes it's best to go straight to the Board of Veterans Appeals. That's uh, where where both of these fellows ended up getting their claims granted. Uh, Augie and Larry were both we both had hearings with the Board of Veterans Appeals. Now, just like there's a couple of different options at the local level, there's a couple of different options with the Board of Veterans Appeals. Uh, you can ask for a hearing, uh, and then you go on the hearing docket. You can uh, take what's called the, uh, the evidence lane docket, which gives you 90 days once you file the appeal to give them new evidence, okay? Or you can do the direct review docket, which is it's on the evidence of record that was in there the last time the VA made the decision. So you can't give them new evidence on a direct review. Okay. If you have, have a hearing, you can't give them new evidence until the hearing and for 90 days after the hearing. <laughs> they, they've interpreted these rules pretty weirdly. If you give them evidence the day before the hearing, the judge cannot consider that evidence. But if you submit it mm -hmm. the day after the hearing, they can submit, they can consider that evidence. You submit it six months after the hearing, they cannot. So direct review oh, lane, lane and hearing lane, all of those are options at the Board of Veterans Appeals. Now, if it's not advanced on the docket, which means it's rushed because of terminal illness, homelessness, uh, something like that, uh, it's going to take a long time, um, especially with a hearing. Uh, this is a very severe disorder, obviously. These have been advanced on the docket, so it does not take as long, thank God, because we would still be waiting for those hearings. Uh, if the Board of Veterans' Appeals denies the case, your option then, under the current appellate system, is to come back to the beginning and file a supplemental claim with new evidence within a year of that board decision or appeal it to the United States Court of Appeals for Veterans' Claims, which is a federal court in the federal court system outside VA altogether. Uh, and and there's only a very small percentage of cases that ever make it to that court. Uh, beyond that is the, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. And then beyond that's the Supreme Court. Uh, and only about one case every blue moon ever makes it to the Supreme Court. So uh, uh, so that's your options. It's a, it's, you know, it's a pretty wide ranging gamut. Um, and it's it can be tough the, deciding what the best option is sometimes. The, and every single case is different. Uh, your timelines are different. Uh, you know, like when 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 Larry came to us, his hearing, it, if I can correct something, it was his hearing that was in nine days. And if that's waited long enough to get that hearing, I, I personally don't want to don't want to withdraw that hearing. Okay. I don't need a hearing in most cases, and I don't want a hearing in most cases. The, this particular disability is, is different, though, uh, and the, the way we're trying to get it service-connected is different. Uh, so a hearing is, 
can be beneficial, what's proven beneficial in, in both of their cases, obviously. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit more about that because there are plenty of people that come to our TMA military veterans with myositis group that already do uh, have applications for different things. And so they do have experience with the process for different um, illnesses or conditions. So you mentioned the difference with IBM. Can you elaborate on that? I, yeah, I can. Um, so I have, to, I have to refer to a different illness, okay? Um, and before I get there, let me let me try to explain the, the 10,000 foot version of what you need for service connection. You need okay. an in-service, a, diagnose, a diagnosis of what you're claiming and a medical link between the two, okay? And so that's, that's your three things you need. If you have those things, if they're adequate, uh, the way the law requires, you can usually get service. So if you if you broke your knee in service, and you you know twenty years later you have bad, you know bad uh, degenerative arthritis, and you get a knee replacement, you go file a claim for that, and they say yeah that knee replacement's due to that break in service, then you got all three of those things. You're probably going to get service connected, right? There are other types of claims where you don't need that medical nexus or that medical link between the two. And that's when a, a disability is presumptively service connected, meaning there's a legal presumption that that something in service caused that disease. Now, now we we see that a lot with Agent Orange. Okay, Vietnam mm -hmm. veterans we have a whole host of things: diabetes, lung cancer, heart condition, prostate cancer. There's a list of them. If you were in Vietnam, there's a legal presumption you were exposed to Agent Orange. If you get a particular disability that's on the list, there's a legal presumption that that exposure caused that uh, that disability. So that's presumptive service connection. And there's a few different ways. You know, Agent Orange is not the only one. Obviously, it's just the most well known. There's a there's one disability that's presumptive just because you were on active duty for 90 days or more, and that is ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease, all right? It, it's not a disease you want. <laughs> uh, it, it, it is terminal, almost all cases, all cases it is. It just depends on how long it's gonna to take to get there. Um, VA was doing research years ago uh, for various things. Part of it was to looking at uh, Gulf War type claims uh, and they, they were looking at some changes in the brain. Um, and, and they decided to, you know, I don't remember all, all the history, but they did a, uh, some research on ALS and determined that veterans of all uh, branches, all eras, Vietnam, you know, post-Vietnam, pre uh, all, all veterans who had 90 days of service or more uh, had a higher rate of ALS than the civilian population did. And they could not put a finger on what was causing that, right? They assume, mm -hmm. and they still assume, there was some exposure to something that veterans are getting at a higher clip than, than the general population that's causing that. And it was a statistically significant increase enough that the secretary at the VA at the time used his legal rulemaking authority and said, you know, we don't know what, what this is, but we're, because this is a rare condition, we're going to make a legal presumption that if you have this much service and you later come down with ALS, we're going to legally presume it's related to your service. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's the only condition like that where there's not a specific event that is triggering that presumption, like a specific exposure. Camp Lejeune water contamination would be one that's there's a legal, that's an event in service. With ALS, service is the event. Okay. And and that's that was carved out as an exception just for ALS. So, what do we know about IBM? Well, IBM we're finding out has that same type of much higher prevalence in the veteran population than compared to the the general population. Uh, and in fact, the numbers from what I've seen, uh, there's a higher prevalence. One, it's a more, it's a less diagnosed disease. It's a rarer disease, as, as I understand, as in terms of sheer numbers of people that get diagnosed with it. But the number of those that are veterans are much higher, from what I understand, 
than the numbers of ALS. So it looks like the prevalence is even higher for IBM, uh, but no one knows it, you know, except these gentlemen with IBM who have been who have been struggling with it for years. And so this group has done, I think, so far a very good job of trying to get that information up to someone's attention, right? To, to try to maybe create the same presumption that ALS has. But in the meantime, you still got individual veterans filing claims. And the hard part then, if I could make a, one single point to all this is when you're going into VA and saying, look, this is like ALS for all these reasons, whatever they are, right? VA, you should grant me service connection simply because you grant service connection for ALS in the same way. And this is very much like ALS. Their mindset is going to shift to, well, what's the, what's the event? Because mine did too. You know, when I'm looking at how do you, how do you prevail in these cases? What's the event in service? You know, because you can't just apply the ALS thing because the secretary carved out an exception that there doesn't have to be an event. Service is the event. And that's the only thing that's like that in the whole system. Everything else requires either an event or a diagnosis or manifestation during service. You know, if, if it started during service, hypothetically, then you wouldn't need an event that triggered it. Okay, so it, it's because it's coincident with service, so that counts as well. Uh, but here you don't have that. Uh, mm -hmm. so you, you know, what do you do? Uh, now, we've seen some, uh, uh, I think the, the, the mystery person that uh, uh, they were talking about earlier, Larry was talking about. We, yeah, we don't say names. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that's uh, that they were granted on the basis of it was so similar to ALS that the board judge just said, "All right, we're going to give you the benefit of the doubt and grant service connection." Now, if it works that way, that's fantastic. And then the thing is, but it, isn't that a crapshoot also because it depends yes. on who's reading whatever you've submitted? Very much because let's just assume all these are going to have to go to the Board of Veterans Appeals. Okay. Uh -huh. I, that's a safe assumption here because your folks at the regional office are not going to believe they're even entitled to grant this benefit in that manner, okay? Mm -hmm. Without an actual event in service and a link to that event. But if you don't have that event, if you didn't have, you can't pull some kind of exposure out of a service record and point to it and then point medical evidence linking the, the disability to that event, you, then you're asking the 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 RO employees to basically apply a law that does not exist. And for that reason, I think for the most part, they're going to get denied. Um, okay. Well, let's get, uh, you know, a bit more granular then for the audience. Uh, when it comes to documentation though, what should they include and, and how should they make this case for that initial? Well, I, so, so far, and we're all learning as we're going here. Uh, mm -hmm. I am not taking off the theory of service connection from the table that posits that it's like ALS, all right? We okay. are full force with that argument because it's a solid argument. Now, so it's not going to hurt you if you include documentation. Like we do have that. Uh, we have a letter from Dr. Todd Cohen. We have a letter from Dr. Tom Lloyd, and they both say that there's a connection and it's not going to hurt, is what you're saying, if you include Absolutely this not. It's not going to hurt okay. at all. Larry's case was very similar to that. And and the board judges are independent. They they Just because one decides a case one way, the one sitting next to them can decide it completely opposite. They are very independent. And they can, and once they decide a case, the people beneath them at the regional office can't do anything about it. Right? They, have to, they have to grant service connection for that case. So... So that's a good argument to make, okay? Because the evidence shows what the evidence shows. But I don't want to rest my laurels on that alone. If there is an exposure that we can that we can link to in the service record, and that could be any number of things, depending on when a veteran served, uh, where they served, uh, you know, is, if they served in Vietnam, if they had some exposure related to their MOS, you know. Anything that you can use to show that 
because we don't know what causes this disease, but we do believe it's an exposure related disease. Um, it, it, you know, almost anything that you, that you could have been exposed to that's different than your general population uh, it is relevant to the case. So, so Augie, did you have exposure then that you could point to? Well, I, well, I had, I had lots of exposures to a, lots of different things, and we um, we included all of those things that because um, I was in aviation when I was in in the my naval service, and um, and I was stationed um, in in places that, for example, that used uh, we had to go through a lot of de-icing fluid uh, up in Iceland. Uh, the year I spent up there, and, and so, oh, but we we identified all these uh, environmental toxins that I have been exposed to, and we included it in the letter, and uh, and and then we, you know, we when we submitted um, our additional evidence that was uh, that was included in in there, and uh, the interesting thing in in my case, I don't know how Larry might have been different but in my case the uh, approval letter that came out the letter from the, the law judge um specifically honed in on one of these environmental toxins that um that she said was um also identified with uh being a uh, a probable cause for ALS so i thought i thought that was that was great and, but i also read in the same letter that this decision could not be used as a precedent for for other cases. Um, that's the downside of it. You know, it's great that we got you know a decision, but the people behind us that are that are going through this process cannot use Larry's and and, and my um, approvals as uh, as a basis for for them to get approved. Okay, so can I get clarification on that? Can yeah. you include it, and then they just can say? we can't use that as precedent or are you saying you can't even put it in there at all yeah. i mean it feels like it might be something that could influence but that verbiage almost sounds like cya right so mm -hmm. you could use it uh for persuasive effect sure uh um, yes in a case now you know obviously the privacy issues and all that you have to yeah they have redact the information right right unless you have the person's you know if you have the person's permission or something obviously but if you just see a decision you know, the, the board of veterans appeals publishes the decisions that they make but they redact the veterans information and so mm -hmm. I, you know, if i have a, a i don't know words, i could use larry's case in another case as long as i didn't say whose case it was and i just referred to the case by the docket number because you, okay. can't, you can't pull up Larry's information with that. You can just pull up the fact mm -hmm. of the case. Um, so you can refer to docket numbers like that unless you have somebody's permission. Um, at the board, there's very specific rules that say uh, that those decisions are not binding. Uh, they are except to that decision. They're binding to that decision. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but there's also rules that say the board uh strives for consistency okay <laughs> and so you know it's perfectly fine to use some examples and say you know we're not you know we can't tell you you must follow your own precedent here because it's not presidential but we can't ask that you strive for the consistency that you kind of already started um now that works if you've got some common themes it, it it's not going to work if in one case, the judge says, well, I'm going to say the Agent Orange exposure that you suffered in Vietnam as likely as not caused your IBM. You know, if there's medical evidence saying that, the judge themselves can't say that. They're, they're not medical experts. But they can rely on a medical expert saying that. In the next case, there is no Agent Orange exposure. Well, that now you've kind of got a pickle. So to the extent that we can use the IBM generally and as it relates to ALS okay which they're you know we and we are uh using that at, like that uh yeah yeah I've got I've got no problem doing that and then we're not breaking any rules doing that and the board will consider it now they you know you don't want to 
tell them that they have to do it because they've done it before or they're you know they might just uh decide not to do it just because they can um, well it's always good to be diplomatic right right <laughs> <laughs> bullying the va is not likely oh, to get no. you the results you you need no. um let's talk a little bit about um what happens if you want to transition from a VSO to an attorney? Can you use them simultaneously or how does that work out? The, the law gener generally allows one representative of record and that's it. Uh, so, you, you know, if you, if you have a VSO, uh, you can't then also have an attorney. Uh, now there, okay. there are some weird uh folks out there that will take a single issue right, um, and say, oh, this is the only issue I'm going to represent you on. Uh, we don't do that. It, you know, I don't know. I don't really know how you do that because you can't have more than one person with uh, access, you know, electronic access to the case in VA system. Mm -hmm. uh, so which of you get that access? Uh, it's just the, the logistics behind it. I, I would not want to deal with. Uh, it's part of mm -hmm. with you know, the logistics as they are. Um, so when we take a case, we take the whole case. Uh, you know, well, what about the VSOs? And Augie, you may know more about this. I heard that um, VSOs generally won't talk to you if they know you've hired an attorney, but service VSOs may be an exception. How how does that work out? And how does a service VSO um, differ from your generic VSO? Well, I well the service, service organization VSOs um, they, you know, they're, they're, they come from national organizations like DAV, Paralyzed Vets, uh, Vietnam, Veterans of America, and, uh, organizations like that. Um, and I think you'll probably find a willing, more of a willingness on their part to talk to you, even though, again, they're going to be restricted. It's going, one person can have electronic access to your records, um, but I know this in my in I live in Georgia, that the uh, the VSOs in Georgia, there's a heavy black line. You know, if you're if you're already talking to an attorney, working with an attorney, they said they'll be happy to talk to you about the weather or anything else, but uh, not about your. Uh, they can't help you with your claim in uh, in any way. Right. Well, let's talk about um, making that transition then if you've been denied and you want to do that, because there's so many options for representation. How do you and you don't want a bunch of people in there muddying the water, whether they have access or not, because I just seen so many different conflicting uh, mm -hmm. opinions out there that influence the practice. So how does a veteran know or research or find the right person, um, you know, except when TMA puts them on a screen on a webinar, right? Well, I think that, yeah, I think that the, uh, uh, it really boils down to what the veteran is um, submitting his claim for. In other words, what, it, if he has got, uh, uh, you know, ALS is, is a no brainer. Um, you know that, and that's the easiest claim to to file because uh, it's already approved. But depending on if it was a uh, you know a Gulf War veteran who is exper exposed to burn pits, that might be something that is so specific. Uh, you know, a, a VSO might be able to help. But when in a case when you have um, a rare disease like Larry and I and and the other uh, members with uh, with uh, IBM have. Um, then I think it really, this is where you, you transition from being able to get any be real benefit from a VSO to really re needing to have the assistance of a legal expert like Kerry um, and, and, and the folks on his team. You really need to have that assistance because it is, we have a, we have a much steeper, steeper hill to climb uh, to get to that approval from the VA than, uh, than, than other um illnesses and Carrie might be able to elaborate on that a little bit more than than that well the, and you, you're absolutely right Augie. um i mean the bottom line is is, is uh, how complicated is your issue how what's at stake uh how long has your case been going on um uh, you know there are there's no shortage 
of complicated cases uh, that one could file. Uh, you know, the laws have come a long way in the past 30 years. Uh, one problem, I mean, I, you know, I don't, and, I, and I'm not going to bash on VSOs. I, 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 uh, it, you know, it, it, if you've got a simple case uh, and there's a presumption and, and or you, you know, clearly got wounded in service and, and, you know, there's a clear line between that and what, what's going on now, you should be able to go to any VSO and file that claim and hopefully VA will do the right thing. Um, you know, but we, we're, things come full circle, you know, we in VA, we're seeing things now, it's outside of IBM and the whole nine yards, but, but we're seeing things now that we thought we had resolved 20 years ago. And all of a sudden they're, they're, they're coming up again as if there are new questions and on how to do things that VA has been getting right for a long time. And now all of a sudden they're getting wrong again. Uh, and, and there's so many other hands in VA, like the, the, the contractors that do the examinations in VA. You know, we have a ton of bad times with some of those VA examiners. Uh, we call them VA examiners, but they're, they're technically private contractors. Um, you know, and so there's no shortage of issues like that that's, that could bring in a very complicated legal issue uh, and because it, it could mess up a claim in all kinds of ways that it may take some 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 real legal knowledge to, to figure out how to navigate uh, and overcome. Um, so and, my question is more geared toward like, let's say you find an attorney that has lots of experience with the VA appeal process in different ways. How important is it that they know IBM and understand IBM? And if they don't, do we then, you know, uh, as the veteran, take it upon ourselves to educate them. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, no. oh, that wants to take that let one. Me jump in on, <laughs> let me jump in on this one because this is something that um, I feel strongly about that um, when it comes to shopping for, for legal representation, um, a person may have a lot of experience filing claims with the VA and he, he knows the ins and outs, but to have, find an attorney that has the understanding of what you're dealing with, with IBM is going to be difficult. You know, <laughs> no offense, Carrie, but Carrie didn't really know anything about IBM when I first talked with him. And well, so we can't find the, doctors that know about IBM, much less uh, attorneys, right, but exactly. go ahead. Much less attorneys. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but but the thing is, is that um, we, you know, we got, Carrie got uh, educated up on, on IBM. And every time that he works with a veteran with IBM on an IBM claim, he just increases his depth of experience uh, on this a little bit more. So to find a an attorney that is random, that you just randomly come across that has that kind of depth of experience is going to be extremely difficult and that's why i you know if the, the veterans that are watching this right now are and, and i'm not being paid to say this but veterans that are watching this now with ibm if you're looking for legal representation carry is the guy to go to because he has gotten such a uh, an education on ibm he probably knows more about IBM than half of my doctors that I that I see right now because he has really had to dive in and and learn about the ins and outs and uh of, of what we're dealing with and uh so and, and I can't I can't uh, tell you how much how much value that brings to your uh, ability to get a positive outcome yeah I would and agree if with that. you are so, yeah Absolutely. If you are using an already with an attorney or thinking of getting one that isn't carry, you know, TMA can help you educate that person. We have a physician's guide that I think would also be helpful. Um, but Larry, you wanted to not only echo his thoughts, but I also wanted to talk to you about that emotional, medical, uh, mental and physical journey that you go on trying to stay the course with the whole process. I mean, you made the comment that you're almost 80 and trying to get um, 
uh, your appeal changed is hard for anybody, but having myositis, dealing with the IBM, the daily um, struggles that you have, how did you um, just stay the course? Well, I won't give up for anything. You know, <laughs> if it's worth fighting for, I'll be fighting for it. But this disease has taken on a lot of people and it has given them a bad feeling for it you know it's like when i first was denied it's like oh hell <laughs> you know i'm never going to win why bother uh but there there are people like carrie that believe in this disorder that we have and the problems that we go through and mm -hmm. i will have to say that carrie for doing augies and winning he had to learn a lot and he also learned a lot from my case. And there were some mm -hmm. things that were brought up in my case from the judge or from the law judge that I didn't even know that were in my records. And there was, you know, I, I was in during Vietnam. Fortunately, I didn't go to Vietnam because I had a, a brother there. But I was never exposed to burn pits or Agent Orange or anything like that. So Carrie dug in deeper and found something that I think helped turn it around. And the judge, right off the bat, he said, I can't believe that the VA has drugged you on for 17 years. And he also said that surprised me that this should be an easy decision. You know, it should, this should be anything but a win. Am I right on that, Carrie? No, you you are. I was uh, I was taken aback. I was shocked. Uh, uh, well, the the, the it, thing was that Carrie yeah. just dug into it, and again, like I say, I had a VSO, and I changed from the VSO to Carrie by a, a form. I can't remember what it is. Twenty two dash something. Twenty one dash allows me to authorize anybody to take over my case and from what i understand the last the last written statement on file is the one that's actually going to handle it and in this case it was carrie so the judge was really understanding uh like i said he brought things up in my case that i didn't even know and uh, there was one other thing that was brought up that uh, I don't know if it had anything to do with it or not, but I had exposure to incendiary devices when I was in the Air Force. And the judge actually said, well, what did you do when you, how'd you clean it up? You know, there's chemicals there. You know, I told him whatever, whatever the man said, I did. You know, if he said, dip your hands in the gasoline and clean them, that's what I did. You know, I was so what most of us did. We were, we were <laughs> trained to do that. Um, right. do what exactly. we're told. So, you know, and with this and Carrie went into it, he only had a few days really to get into my case the way he did with Augie. And I know that you know, he's he's gained every every case that he goes into, he learns more. And it was, we had a decision in three days. I mean, really, in three days. And we, we uh, waived the 90 days afterwards, uh, but actually, I think by suggestion of the judge, because he said that he thought he may be able to even rule on the case. So he not only heard the case, but he felt he could rule on it as well. And wow. within three days after the hearing, I get he waived the hearing forward. transcript, uh, which generally takes you know a couple of months. He said, eh, yeah. maybe I need the transcript back. I can go ahead and decide it. And I had never ever seen the, the board do that ever. Wow. And um, and then also kind of explain about how they do the compensation, because I understand you do get back pay, but I don't know what from what date. Go ahead, Carrie. 
I mean, you know. Yeah, so that's, that's we're talking about the effective date. Uh, and that's, okay. that can be its own world of, <laughs> of complication. <laughs> uh, uh, and, 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 you know, or it can go quite easily. Uh, technically speaking, it, as long as the claim is alive and, uh, and pending, uh, either pending a decision or pending on appeal, it, the effective date, it, let's say, of service connection, right? Service connection, mm -hmm. a few things, should go back to that date. Now, if if you got a claim from 10 years ago and it was denied and it was not appealed or the appeal expired, that that claim is, is kind of history, right? When you come in and file again, that reopens that claim. And if, if they deny it, you appeal it within a year and keep it on appeal. Now you've got one continuous claim. So it's the, the effective date's generally going to go back to that uh, to that active claim. VA is it was one of the things that we you know we we thought we had kind of gotten over with VA bad effective dates. They're bad. They're terrible now. Um, not so much the effective dates of service connection, but they'll 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 service connect it from one point, but they'll only give the highest rating for maybe yesterday's examination, when nothing in the case had changed for the past two years. Right. And so we're always fighting that kind of stuff. We it's been so mm -hmm. bad. We've raised it to VA central office to the undersecretary and and his uh, and all his people. Uh, it, it's just. It, it's really terrible right now. Yeah. I want the audience to know, though, that it isn't like it doesn't start from as soon as you get the appeal. I mean, regardless of what the effective date is, there is some amount of back pay that you right. can expect if your yeah. appeal is approved. And the you said that um, an a, a firm can charge up to a third, but um, I'm assuming that's a third of back pay. It's not like a third until uh, your right, death. A third is only of back pay. What, uh, right. A third okay. only of back pay. Uh, anything going forward, we can't touch. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, whatever is, is considered retroactive compensation, that's our fees are limited to that and that alone. Uh, okay. so, I mean, and so that, that's something that and I'll say it might make us sound greedy, but it it, it that's where we're going to differ from from uh, a VSO. You know, no offense to VSOs, we have a dog in the fight to try to get that better as as much benefits as we can, as we can legally get. Yeah, them. you have skin in the game, right? And and we take that seriously, uh, you know. And so that's what we do. Um, and so that you know it. it you know, let's take that for what it's worth. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we're not going to, I draw a line in a number of places. You know, I'm not going to jeopardize the veterans' benefits that they're getting now to try to get more back pay. Okay. If I mm -hmm. think there's a legitimate uh, potential harm for their current benefits, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Uh, and, and, and what I'll, scenario would that might play out? Uh, I'm just wondering because we do have some people that have, uh, let's say they have 80% from whatever that's non-IBM. Are you implying that they could risk that 80 if they push for the 100 with the adding the IBM? Not Usually not. Not, not if the IBM is completely set. Right? Uh, okay. If you're already getting something for other, other disabilities and you don't raise anything regarding those disabilities, um, it, you know, then you're usually pretty safe, right? Uh, but sometimes all it takes is one bad examination to make somebody ask a question uh, as to whether you know they should look at reducing a benefit. And you know, a good example would be, and I, and I have not run into any of this, anything like this with IBM, and and I can't really foresee me doing so. Um, but let's say a vet's getting forty percent for a, a back condition, uh, twenty percent for radiculopathy of each leg. Uh, and that can be really severe. Okay, it, it, the odds of that veteran going higher than forty percent is is almost slim to none, regardless of how severe that back condition is, simply because of how 
the rating schedule is designed for that particular disability. And there's a lot of back conditions out there, okay? Used to, uh, prior to 2001, it was a little bit easier to rate that condition. It would go up to 60, and it does technically go to 60 now. It's the highest you can get. But, but for example, to get that, you need doctor-prescribed bed rest for six weeks out of the year. Well, the doctor's not going to prescribe bed rest for six weeks out of the year because doctors don't prescribe bed rest anymore for a, a back condition. They want you moving. It, it, that's laying in one position for six weeks is is worse for your back. Right, right. So you're not going to get, you're not going to meet that criteria for 60%. So that 40 is 99% based on range of motion. You go into that new, and say you want unemployability for that. And you go in to file a claim for unemployability, which is you're trying to get 100% because you can't work. Uh, and and they're going to re-examine that back condition, okay? Because if that's the basis for your unemployability. And let's say that day you were able to bend over a little further, but your back hasn't gotten any better. Uh, now yeah, it was just it a look, good day. Yeah, it may look to that examiner that, oh, or mm. that rater that, oh, you can bend over further than when we awarded 40%. <laughs> now we have to propose a reduction. All right. Well, or, the math is something else yeah. for sure. Yeah. And it's a little depressing. So I don't want to end on that note. We've been talking for a while. So let's talk, uh, try to end on a happy note. And Augie, you wanted to add something? I just wanted to add something. I just wanted to point out this, this was just an, an outstanding example of the difference between using a professional like Carrie and using a VSO. All that information that he just discussed that he went over is not something that you're going to find from your typical VSO. This is that this is Carrie's depth of experience that's really coming into play here. Absolutely, because VSOs, they have a normal turnover rate of their they, their people that help. And right. so, and most of them have their own career trajectories. And so you're not going to find somebody who has 25 experience, 25 years experience, most likely. Um, but um, what would you guys like to, have we covered everything we need to cover in this time? Did you want to? One, one other thing that I wanted to cover, and it goes back to when we were talking about environmental exposures. There's a good resource that can be found on the webs, on the Hill and Potton website. And it's a resource that shows, um, I'm sorry, I, I have a tendency to talk with my hands too much. Um, oh, it's fine. I've been uh, having my head in my hands, drinking my <laughs> coffee, looking no. out the window. It's fine. Go but ahead. There's a resource on the Hill and Potton website that shows the location of all the military bases across the U.S. And mm -hmm. you can put in there the bases that you have been stationed at, and it will show you the uh, environmental toxins that are associated with that, that particular station. So it's a really good resource for for anybody if they're use end up using um, a, another attorney with Hill and Bond besides Carrie, which <laughs> heaven forbid. But um, <laughs> anyway, it's a real good resource to get to get your brain stimulated into things that you've been exposed to as you were on uh, active duty. Well, and I would say go ahead. I would say one thing that Carrie has gone way over and above that I could never expect from a VSO. Uh, when my award was granted and they said that I had service connection, you would automatically think that I'd get 100%. I got 0% wow. of disability. And Carrie was on the phone before I even had a chance to call him because I had the same notice he did. And he made an additional effort to do something that I probably would never expect any other attorney to do, or I would never expect a VSO to do it. And that's why I would recommend Kerry for anything. He has gone way, way over and above for myself and my family. And Kerry, you can tell him what you did. When when we got to zero, and I don't want to use those terms, so you. Well, I had to resist the urge to go up my roof and jump off. Uh, 
when I saw that because that was, I mean, literally, it was the worst decision I had ever seen. I mean, you're talking about a guy that can't, that's got loss of use of all four extremities, and just leave it at that, right? Not even going right. on with the residuals, come out with a zero percent. But the very first thing in the claims file beneath the decision was a 2680, which is an aid in attendance form. Uh, from 2019 that showed back then he warranted in attendance uh, back then. <laughs> and so how do you come out with a 0%? Uh, and, and, and it was probably more out of just sheer frustration. Uh, but I, 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 I tried to send a message to the leadership of that particular office. Uh, they didn't answer me uh, uh by you know soon <laughs> i asked him not to <laughs> issue that decision um and to correct it before before larry got this this insult in the mail um uh, and the next morning it was authorized and 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 i sent it to the whole leadership team of that office so they, they could have seen it um or they probably did see it um, so I went to the uh, Office of Administrative Review, which is in charge of all the appeals around the country. Um, and and you know, I know this gentleman and, and, and he's busy uh, every single day. And I politely told him I, if he's busy, I'm going to continue to elevate it. Um, and by the end of the day, I haven't heard from him. So I took it up to the undersecretary's office um, and he responded at 930 at night. And, and got that other gentleman on the phone and the next day it was fixed. For, for most of it was fixed. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and, and so I credit the undersecretary for doing that. Uh, it, you know, and, and they assured me that that person that rated it would get trained, but you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know I, I don't know if that will, uh, what happened with that. Well, that's the over and above what a good attorney can do for you. Yeah, and part of that's because I, I, you know, my former position in VA, that's, uh, you know, I, I, I know how to, I know how to get up there when something's that atrocious. But I, I also, I, I can't do that with every case because they would eventually shut the door on me, and 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 you know, right. But, but this was, you know, this was worth it. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, this it was bad. But I would like to add something. I, I you know, it. Mm, it's not just me doing this. You know, I, I when this was Matt Hill and I looked at this. Matt Hill's managing partner for uh, Hill and Ponton, and uh, uh, Brian Hill and Carol Ponton are the uh, the founders. They they both still work there, uh, uh, and, and and are very very active. You know, it, it. So I've got some support behind me. This was a decision that 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 we made collectively, uh, whether we thought we could take on. Uh, these cases now, I realize there's not a ton of them. Um, it, you know, it, in VA, you either typically get issues that are that can be severe, but you know, they they may not be very severe that affect a ton of veterans, or you've got very severe issues that affect fewer veterans. It, it and sometimes it's in the middle. Now, this is this is a rare condition, but you know, those that it affects, it affects severely, and you know, I, not a lot of people could have the resources to take this on. Uh, and I'm not saying don't go to anybody else, but I know that's not what I mean by that. It's just, you know, we're busy too. Uh, you know, we're, you know, it, it's not easy to make these decisions knowing that, you know, this is probably going to require more late nights than we already, than we already put in. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, so, but I wouldn't be able to do that if, if, if Helen Pond was behind me uh, supporting me on it. Um, uh, and, and, uh, I know, uh, Brian Hill has, has he's, you know, he and I talked about these a couple of weeks ago and he wants, uh, to handle, uh, an IBM case, which is, uh, <laughs> he's been practicing law for. Yeah. Know, well, uh, be careful what you wish uh, for, <laughs> but you can tell Brian <laughs> Rachel said that because I grew the group from three to over 300 
and the, and I want the audience to know, please, we have uh, military veterans with myositis affinity group. It's not just a place to uh, gripe about the VA, although that definitely happens. And um, it is uh, every second Sunday of the month at noon Eastern, and both Larry and Augie are members of that group, and we welcome you to uh, mm -hmm. join. It's so nice to spend time with brothers and sisters in arms. So thank each of you for your service. And because we pre-recorded this, we do not have a Q&A. Um, so if you did not get a question answered, please send it to me, rachel at myositis.org, R-A-C-H-E-L at myositis.org, and I will uh, get an answer for you. And you can, of course, uh, reach out to Carrie Baker at Hill and Ponton. Thank you, Augie. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Carrie, for everything. We really appreciate you. Thank you for your service, Thank you, Rachel. Appreciate it. Oh, well, yeah, five years in Europe on the radio. It was so hard, but you're welcome. <laughs> you were there. <laughs> Thanks, right. Carrie. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Rachel. Right. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye, guys.